Hi folks, welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Rudin and we are building the Catalina Wherry. Now in the last episode we laminated up a bunch of material to make the stem and stern post for our boat. Now I want to thank Bob Emser from the Art of Wooden Boat Building for loaning us some of his footage to make that episode a little bit more interesting. Now today we're going to take those laminations and we are going to transform those into our finished parts. So why don't you sit back and relax and let me take care of the work. All right, we've had 24 hours of uh, waiting and it's time to break apart our mold here and see what we got. So let's just start peeling the clamps off. Ooh, I heard the first little crackle. Oh, there we go. That one sprung on its own right there. As soon as the batten came off. And I can see my part has sprung out just about the exact amount that I overshot, that I accounted for. Now when we're laminating, there's something we have to worry about and that's called spring back. And that's the material that we're using, wanting to return to its original state, which is straight. We've forced it into a curve and we're holding it there with adhesives. Now I try to compensate for spring back when I'm making my molds. I over bend the shape a little bit, taking a wild guess at what the actual finished shape might be after it springs back. Sometimes I'm lucky and I get it right on the money and sometimes I'm not quite so lucky. Now you can limit the amount of spring back by using more thinner laminations, but that also means more waste. It's more wood that gets turned into sawdust as you try to make thinner laminations. The last thing you have control over is the type of adhesive you use. Now I've used epoxy in this case, and it's particularly good at laminating stuff in that it is a very rigid adhesive when you're done. Historically, you might come across references to resorcinol glue. That stuff is still around, but it's a little more finicky in terms of clamping pressure and temperature control. A slightly less toxic option might be using weldwood plastic resin glue, which is basically a powder you mix with water. It's a urea formaldehyde type glue, uh, but it's relatively safe in that there's no off-gassing to really worry about. It's particularly good for laminating because it's just a little bit gritty. And so when you clamp your parts together, they don't tend to want to slide apart like they will with epoxy or other slippery types of adhesives. Now there's also Type Bond 3, which is sort of a PVA glue that's fully waterproof. It works quite good, but uh, it's a little bit more on the flexible side. And so it is likely to spring back a little bit more. That said, I've used it very successfully many times it being a PVA glue, your working time's a little bit different than with epoxy though. You have to perhaps work a little bit faster because it's going to absorb into the wood a little bit more and may tend to dry up a little bit faster if you're working with thinner volumes of glue. Now the last choice are polyurethanes and there are several types. There's the foaming polyurethane like Excel or Gorilla Glue. I find those quite messy to work with and I don't like them so I would not personally be using them for laminations. However, other people certainly do and have great success with them. There's also the types of polyurethanes that come in caulking tubes, namely 3M's 5200 or Sikaflex 291. They're very, very viscous materials and I don't think they'd be great for laminating, but they are good when you only have sort of a single joint to deal with. You could try them, they might work out okay. And then lastly, there are construction adhesives, which are also polyurethanes. Now I've never used those in a boat building project. I've heard of other people doing so. They're certainly a little more rigid than the flexible polyurethanes like 5200 or Sikaflex. If you were to do that, I would experiment with it first, do a trial glue up, try soaking it, try breaking it, see if you can prove that it's going to work for you before you commit to using it in your project. After all, it isn't really intended for marine use. In a dry sail boat, it might be okay. Okay, we ready for it? Here we go. Listen for the crackle. Ah, nice. Now look at that, that worked out beautifully. Now we're gonna clamp these to the bench and I'm gonna use a belt sander to clean them up. I just wanna get rid of all the excess glue. There's a couple little low spots. I'm not gonna worry about that right now. There's more work to do. You could use a heat gun and scraper for this job, but I think it takes a bit longer. 
I usually reserve that for situations where I don't want to sand the surface very much afterwards. Now our stern post is relatively small, so I'm going to clean it up on the table saw. With one side sanded fairly even, I'm just going to carefully run this through, just taking a little bit off one face. I'm going to try to be careful that I'm keeping the face of the stern post down to the table saw surface. Of course, I've got a feather board on there to help try and control it. This is certainly a bit of a dicey operation, but the part is small enough that I feel confident I can do it with relative safety. Now, if all went well, I should have a nice square face. So I'm just going to check that in a few spots, make sure there isn't any wind. And if everything's good, we're just going to mark our reference faces. Now that one side of the stern post lamination is trued up, we'll readjust the fence and rip it down to close to its finished thickness. I'll leave just a little bit extra to either sand off, hand plane, or pass through the smaller thickness planer that I have. Now the stem is quite a bit larger and more unwieldy than the stern post, so I don't think it's the safest idea to try and clean it up on my table saw, even if I had the ceiling height to accommodate it. So we'll use the jointer to clean up one face instead, and then we'll use the thickness planer to bring those two faces down to be parallel. This is the, our stern knee or transom knee or stern post or whatever you want to call it. And uh, we need a bit of deadwood for it. And I found this beautiful piece of red cedar. And this is your opportunity to use up shorts whenever you get little pieces like this. This one will just make it no problem. Because I've laminated this portion of the knee up, it gives it an awful lot of strength and I can get away with something that's not quite as dense or, or resilient as, as this for the deadwood. And so I can take advantage of the fact that because this is so strong, I can make this a lot lighter and shave a little bit of weight off. There's going to be a little haunch in here where the deadwood and the knee meet the transom. It's easier to sort of get part of this cut first and planed off nice and flat and then marry it to the dead wood over here. So I'll just start with my lamination and juggle it around on my pattern here until I've found the spot where it seems to cover all the areas that it needs to. And uh, I'm gonna give myself a few marks on here to indicate where the stopping and starting positions are on it. Now our lamination may or may not fully jive up with our drawing. That's fine. Uh, the most important thing is that I give my, make sure that I have enough meat but this down here, and if we look at this, there's sort of a, if this is cutting it pretty tight, you know, I can just, just squeeze this dead wood out of this piece of cedar. So I've got to make sure I don't uh, undershoot my marks at all. And if anything, if I can go a little bit over, that's even better. I think I, I don't have to worry about making up the entire thickness of this if I don't want to. There's, there's plenty of strength here. Those two points just need a straight line that flows through and then the rest of it is basically the toe which is going to finish up somewhere down here. Our spring back lost us a little bit of meat and I guess I should have added a bit more there but that's fine. I'm not worried about that. But we end up with a very long foot here when you look at it. That's good. So we'll cut this out and then uh, we'll marry the other piece to the bottom here and then we'll worry about cutting the last bit out once it's glued on and we'll probably pre-cut that as well. The main thing is I want to get this shaped first. Juggle it into position and then we're good. I think I'll just give myself a little mark here to indicate where that should interact. Right there. All right.
just using this to support my straight edge. And there's our line right in there. We'll let the top of it run long um, and trim it after the boat is further underway because I don't know exactly where this is going to end. We're going to be doing something with the shear line that will determine where this gets cut off. So I'll wait for a little while before I worry about that. And then down here I put a little mark and that is roughly where this guy stops. So right there. Right there. Okay, well, let's go trim this off. And I like to use just like a bandsaw for doing this sort of thing. You could set this on a jig on the table saw, but I find just following that line of the bandsaw and cleaning it up by hand is the fastest route. Nice sharp plane. Just let the saw marks guide your way. In epoxy construction, it's always a good idea to scuff up your gluing surfaces with some 80 grit sandpaper. bench here we need to transfer this shape onto there. Always picking for snipe. Snipe is when your planer takes a slightly deeper bite at the beginning and end of every board that you push through it. Okay I'm glad I checked that. Make sure I have sort of a squared off termination point because it can be hard to t judge exactly where something starts and stops when it's on an extreme angle. So there we go. So if I don't have enough meat here, worst case scenario is I clean that off and I can glue that onto the backside. Let's just make sure we mark our upward direction and over the bandsaw to cut this out. One of the things I learned about boat building is while there's a lot of specialty tools out there for creating curved things, you're better off just trying to fabricate things yourself as you need them. In this case, this is just a piece of stiff high density polyethylene that I've attached some self-adhesive sandpaper to both sides of. And that's great for getting into gentle curves like this and conforming to a curve just enough to fare it out. Note how I'm just using my fingers to mark a high spot while I reach for my spoke shave in order to fare this out a little bit further. I'll often use my fingers to mark a location that needs a little bit more attention, or sometimes I'll use visual clues like a knot or a piece of darker grain, anything that can help me reorient myself to a location that needs a little bit more refinement. It's faster than reaching for a pencil or a piece of chalk, and sometimes these marks can screw you up as you move farther and farther through the refinement process and more and more marks keep getting added to the surfaces you're working on. I'll be the first to admit that I'm shooting for a much tighter joint than I need. I could leave this quite rough, glue it together with epoxy and it would be just fine. In fact, most of what we see here is going to be hidden because it's all going to get painted over. But I can't help myself, I just like to achieve these tight fits when I can. It's just part of being a craftsman. There we go, that's a nice fit. So 
So now I'll just lay out the rest of the dead wood. Throw a couple bits of masking tape across this just to make sure it stays where we want it to. Okay, so that one goes right there. That's my primary registration mark. That's curious. Hmm. Why is that not quite? That's not on, darn it. What's going on here? Problematic. Shift it up, and this is off the mark. Oh, this is so frustrating. Why did it end up wrong? All right, well, I have to ponder how I want to fix this then. Put a little shim in there. That's one way I can fix it. Gym up here. That's another way I can fix it. Well, every now and then small mistakes do happen, so rather than get all wound up about it, best to just soldier on. This feels like the this is the least impact fix down here, so I think we'll go with that. So frustrating. Just this tiny little triangle missing right here. We'll see if our offcut will fill in that gap. that at a slightly steeper angle. Well, that was a surprisingly difficult little thing to try and fit just there. I mean, I got it reasonably quickly, but still you'd think you just whittle off the end and it'll drop right in. I spent a bunch of time dancing around with the big belt sander trying to get that to fit just right. Okay. Looking at it now, that gap was so completely insignificant, but at the time it felt like it was a great massive chasm that needed filling. Dot dot. Oh no, I gotta glue this on, that's what basically what I should do. Yeah, I think I'm gonna glue this up and then we'll, we'll chop the rest away, would be the smart thing. So I just wanna make sure I've got a really good registration mark for gluing up there. Do another one over here. I should chop this out right now. That probably wouldn't be a terrible idea. To do that. And then that joint is done. Does that make sense? Finish the layout and cut out. With our stern post and deadwood glued up, I've trimmed it to its basic shape and I've marked a few reference lines on there. So we have what we would call the rabbit line and that's where the ends of the plank meet the outboard face of the stern post and the bearding line where the inboard face of the planks meet the inboard face of the stern post and there's a couple plank lines on there as well which I'll be referencing later on in the building process. So all I want to do right now is just hack away all the wood that is definitely not going to be in our finished boat and we're going to leave a, a generous amount that's going to get trimmed away once it's all set up on the mold but it's just much easier to do this kind of work down here at the bench. So starting with a chisel to sort of hog away as much as possible, I'll switch to a plane to apply a little bit more finesse to this process. On the flip side, we'll learn from our previous experience and I'm going to switch up to a slick here, which is just a little bit more efficient at moving larger bits of wood. And yes, one of these days I'm going to do something about getting the wobble out of this workbench. 
And now all you freaks that just have a thing for watching wood chips fall can have your moment. Now a lot of people might reach for a laminate trimmer or router with a round over bit for doing this last little step, but this is the stuff I really, really enjoy doing by hand. And that's just adding a slight chamfer or round over to these edges that are going to be exposed. This is the sculptural element that I think is the difference between good workmanship and good craftsmanship. As I finish up the shaping on this stern knee, I just want to thank all of my viewers who watch these videos, who like them, share them, and comment on them. I also want to thank all of my supporters on Patreon whose monthly contributions make these videos possible. If you'd like to join me on Patreon, you can find links in the corner or down in the description. I've got the stem roughed out now. I had to add a couple layers of extra laminations to make up for some difference in shape. I've retuned the leading edge to match my pattern. The one that's in the back, I can leave it alone. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just gonna be a little extra meat on the inside of the stem, which is fine. I've cut the joint for the, the connection between the stem and the keel, so that'll just drop right on there and that'll just notch over the keel itself. And I've cut it down to the top of my strong back here. So the next thing I need to do is bevel the stem. And so that all starts with marking a center line. And I like to use a, a marking gauge with a sort of a little cutting knife. And I'm just going to mark a center line all the way down the back. And I like the knife because it doesn't disappear so easily. This starts back at the lofting when we work out sections of the stem. And from those sections it's going to tell us how wide our leading edge is of the stem here and how wide it is at the back. And if there is what we call a bearding line, which is where the this, this face of the stem meets the face of the planking at the back side of the uh, stem here. We call that a bearding line. And so my job is to try and mark all of that out. So to that end, I've basically marked off all of my points where I did sections on this, the lofting, and I'm gonna transfer them onto the stem here itself, and then just go through it and describe those lines, carry those around, and mark where those bevels are, and then draw some lines. And in a nutshell, what I'll be doing is using dividers and just pulling these, these dimensions right off of the lofting and transferring them onto the stem. Okay, so I've got my lines marked out on both sides. So there's the, the face of the stem and there's the back of the stem pretty much comes to the edge of the, uh, the billet here, although there's a few spots where it starts to creep down towards the, the heel here. For the now, what I want to do is just get rid of the bulk of this uh, beveling. And so a really simple way of sort of keeping track of that is to just take a saw and cut down to your two uh, extremities there. So I'm just following these layout lines. I stop when I get down to my line on the stem face. And then I focus on the line up at the top, which is really just at the edge. And I use a few light strokes to just try and connect those two dots with a flat line. And that's 
just going to make it easy for me to just sort of hog away the bulk of the material. I could use like a slick or something to knock away the worst of it and then work my way down towards the line and we'll stop short. We'll keep a, a, a fat sixteenth of an inch uh, back from the line to allow for fairing once it's on the boat. to it. Now I can take this away and I can uh, figure out the best way of doing the beveling on this. So I decided I'm going to use the bandsaw to rough this out and I've picked a bevel that's going to be workable throughout the whole length of the stem. Obviously it's not going to be accurate throughout the whole length but it'll be good enough for getting rid of the bulk of the material. You'll notice that those cuts I made to the face of the stem are coming in handy in that the waist is falling away in small pieces and that means I don't have the full length of that waste material flopping around and making it harder to control the stem as I push it through the bandsaw. Now as we approach the heel of the stem that bevel sweeps out fairly radically so I can't do that with the fence in place. Luckily those stop cuts are allowing me to just stop short of the end. Now I can switch over to the other side. Getting the other side started is a little bit more difficult because the cut sweeps into the face of the stem. I'm going to have to freehand it for a little while until I can move the fence into place so that it can help me out. And then it's back to the first side to finish off the cut. So we'll remove the fence and we're just going to freehand it to get rid of that last bit of extra material as it sweeps towards the heel. Now that finished beveling isn't super pretty but it doesn't have to be because we can do a little bit of cleanup at the bench and then it's ready to go on to the mold. All right, there we go. We have our stem and stern post ready to go. Now the stem is ready to go onto the mold and get finished up once the mold is set up. The stern post, however, is going to get fastened to our transom and we will take care of that in the next episode. So please join me again. And I want to thank everybody on Patreon who helps support this channel. If you can help me out on Patreon, links in the corner, down in the description. Remember to subscribe. Until next time, keep your stick on the ice. Of course, you need some ice, but it's winter, so there's lots of ice around. If you can't find ice, I can't can't help you. But if you can't find a stick, I could make you a stick. But I, you know, I'm busy. I'm busy building the boat. So maybe you should make your own stick. Okay.